the first two lines for $59.99. Critics across the country agree. If that 10 second loading screen brought a dose of nostalgia rushing back, you're not alone. I'm sure you remember the PS2, and even more than that, vividly remember the games. But what you probably don't remember is how it all began. The betrayal, the rivalry, the backstabbing. And I'm not even talking about Microsoft. The history of the PlayStation is as fascinating and controversial as the console itself. And as we sit on the cusp of the next big console revolution, I thought now would be a better time than ever. Take a look back at how Sony's PlayStation went from an experiment gone wrong to a cornerstone of the industry. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. The tech world is no stranger to rivalries. Mac versus PC, iPhone versus Android, AMD versus Intel, and of course, Microsoft versus Sony. Most people know that the two companies are constantly taking jabs at each other. But the real console rivalry started years earlier and long before Sony was ever looking to take down Microsoft. It was fighting an even bigger enemy, Nintendo. But first, we need to take a walk. The Sony Walkman. Before they were known as a major player in the video game industry or an international entertainment juggernaut, Sony was a relatively unknown brand to most consumers for many years. It wasn't until the 1980s when the Walkman took off that Sony really became a household name. Because of the Walkman's success, Sony chose not to deviate too much from its core business, but they did work on emerging technologies that would undoubtedly shape the company for years to come. It was around this time, and completely unbeknownst to top-level Sony executives, that the company truly entered into the console market for the first time. Well, sort of. Inside the R&D labs of Sony, an engineer named Ken Kutaragi worked secretly to develop specialized components for a new system by video game giant Nintendo. Kutaragi, regarded by many as the father of the PlayStation, was immediately drawn to consoles after watching his daughter play the Famicom in the late 1980s. He immediately saw the limitless opportunities and possibilities with this emerging technology, and repeatedly pleaded to Sony management to develop a gaming console of their own. But Sony executives didn't share the same feelings as Kutaragi. They viewed the video game industry as childish and primitive and didn't want Sony to become some, quote, toy company. This would make for quite a surprise when Sony executives discovered that Kutaragi had been working secretly with a team inside of Sony to develop a special audio chip for the yet-to-be-released Super Nintendo Entertainment System. When Kutaragi's supervisors discovered the project, they were furious, to, to put it mildly. It was only thanks to then Sony CEO Norio Oga that Kutaragi wasn't immediately fired. He actually stepped in and gave the project the green light to continue. The audio chip designed by Sony would be a small but crucially important component to the new gaming system that really set the SNES apart from the rest of the pack. Its special 16-bit DSP allowed it to produce a stereo audio output that could generate special effects like echo. It might not seem like a big deal today, but it was in the 1980s, and that little chip would set Sony and Nintendo up for a second project that would make even more headlines than either of them was ready for. For people who grew up in the computer era, their first taste of digital technology was probably with a video game, a hugely successful invention that first made its appearance in the mid-70s. 1991 was going to be a huge year for Sony, and at CES that summer, the company made an announcement that would change history forever, but not in the way that they had planned. This was supposed to be the big day, when that would go down in history as a breakthrough collaboration between two titans of industry. For years, behind the scenes, Sony and Nintendo working together on a new console that was set to revolutionize the gaming industry. Dubbed the PlayStation, the prototype was sort of a Frankenstein console, combining together the tried and true cartridge system with next generation breakthrough CD reader that would give this new console the power to play both types of media. But after years of hard work and constant reassurance to Sony executives from Kutaragi that this product would be worthwhile, the partnership between the two companies 
never actually happened. That's because just a day after Sony publicly announced it would be working with Nintendo on the PlayStation project, Nintendo had an announcement of their own. Yes, they would be adopting this new cutting edge CD technology, they would instead be working with Philips on the project, not Sony. This wasn't just a stab in the back for Sony, but a betrayal that would send shockwaves to the industry. It was rumored that Nintendo backed out of the Sony deal because they felt like they were giving up too much control and getting back too little in their cut of the profits. So they opted for another partner that could fulfill Sony's role in the project and also play by their rules. So to say Kutaragi and Sony executives were furious would be an understatement. This was a breaking point, a point of no return. And now, more than anything, they wanted revenge. Sony CEO Norio Oga was so upset by Nintendo's public betrayal that he tasked Kutaragi and his team to build Sony's own gaming console from the ground up. They didn't want to be a part of the video game market. They now wanted to own it. And Sony officially formed a new corporation, Sony Computer Entertainment, in 1993, and was now on a mission to bring the PlayStation from concept to reality, but this time, all on their own and on their own terms. Actually, I was out of a job, and I called a temporary agency. They asked on the phone if I'd like to play video games. <laughs> I was like, yeah. The original PlayStation was created in the vein of big plans and lofty ambitions by a dedicated team inside of Sony who saw gaming at the forefront of the company's future. But not everyone felt the same way. Not even close. Remember that at this point in history, Sony had built a reputable brand amongst consumers in the electronic space. But the company had zero credibility in video games, and consumers and executives alike were like, obviously skeptical. So while some prototypes have leaked out, it was rumored that Sony had actually even mass produced a small number of the original PlayStation consoles that included both cartridges and CDs, but ultimately ditched the hybrid approach, opting to instead wait for the next wave of consoles and leverage the increased storage size of the compact disc. So next, they needed to make it different and unique from Sega and Nintendo. They knew they needed two things, good technology to power the system and a library of games people would actually want to play. They decided to lay a foundation inside the PlayStation of powerful internals and 3D capable hardware in effort to woo developers into Sony's corner. So the original PlayStation X, which would drop the X before it launched, ran off of a pretty powerful 32-bit processor, and at the time, a whopping two megabytes of RAM and one megabyte of video RAM. I know that sounds like nothing by today's standards, but this hardware combo allowed Sony to lead the pack by displaying real-time 3D graphics. The system was fast enough to push more polygons and capable of displaying a new class of three-dimensional games that Sony hoped would set the PlayStation apart. It was an absolute beast for the mid-1990s. The new console was a tough sell of developers though, especially with many kind of hesitant to devote the time and resources necessary to develop 3D games. Companies thought it would just be too expensive and quite frankly, too hard for them to do all this extra work this new console made by a company virtually unknown to gamers. But ironically, after Sega of all companies released their 3D Virtual Fighter game, developers came flocking to Sony to work with them on what many agreed to be the next big leap in console graphics. The PlayStation team started to build some real momentum. They signed on a bunch of developers to produce games for the PlayStation. They even purchased a developer called Synosis and a few others that would make up their own in-house game studio called Sony Interactive Entertainment, and the console was finally on the cusp of making its global debut. Finally, in December of 1994, the PlayStation officially launched in Japan, becoming an almost instant hit, selling over 1 million units in its first three months. The company's next hurdle would be breaking into the US and European markets. Leveraging the success of overseas sales, Sony spent a rumored $4 million on an E3 booth in 1995, and way more on the advertising campaign that followed it. It was definitely a unique campaign, embracing cryptic messaging and slogans to just hype up the console. PlayStation execs would later say that it was all done in an effort to get the Sony name away from the console's branding. They wanted to make it clear that the Sony behind the PlayStation was not your parent Sony. This console was all about a gaming lifestyle, and Sony wanted to appeal to a more serious, and more mature gaming audience. And the plan worked. 
When the PlayStation went on sale in North America in September of 1995, it was immediately a winning combination. 17 games were available to play on the $299 console at launch. By the end of the year, 800,000 units were sold in North America alone. PlayStations flew out the door the moment they were back on store shelves, and the rise of the PlayStation would begin to send shockwaves to the industry. Sony wasn't trying to make a console for fun. They were hell-bent on becoming number one. The PlayStation was, by all accounts, a smashing success. But instead of cherishing the moment, the PlayStation team went back to work on a little project called PS2. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, happy 2000! So a few years later, at the dawn of the new millennium, in 2000, the gaming world was anxiously waiting the release to the highly rumored successor to the original PlayStation. And a lot had changed since that system made its debut about five years earlier, and the console wars were heating up to be more competitive than ever before. So Nintendo was on the cusp of releasing GameCube, although still riding higher from the success of the N64. Sega, still a major player, had recently released a Dreamcast, and rumors were swirling that the Seattle software company called Microsoft was planning to debut a console of their own. After much anticipation, Sony released a PlayStation 2 in Japan, followed shortly by a launch in North America a few months later in October. The second gen console refined the very best parts of the original PlayStation, debuting a new black DualShock 2 controller, a sleek new design, and backwards compatibility, allowing the PS2 to play PS1 games something that was totally unheard of in the console space at the time. It packed more powerful internals, a CD drive capable of playing DVDs, and was, by fans and critics alike, well received and a very worthy successor to Sony's first console. It lived up to the hype and sold incredibly well. So remember it took the original PlayStation three months to sell one million units in Japan? The PS2 sold 980,000 in just one day. Suffice it to say, gamers couldn't get enough of the new PS2, but that didn't mean it was without some fierce competition. The next few years introduced a new lineup of next-gen consoles, with the GameCube, PS2, and Xbox, all competing to be the sole game console of choice for tens of millions of households around the world. So although the Dreamcast and GameCube ended up not being huge threats to Sony, the same couldn't be said about the Xbox. When Microsoft entered the video game market, a fierce and bitter rivalry was born. In a lot of ways though, Microsoft took some notes directly from Sony's own playbook. They were a company entering a totally new space with a lot to prove, just like Sony was a few years earlier. They wanted to win with their power and graphics capabilities. We're targeting a more mature audience, more serious gamer, and wanted to give customers new features that they just couldn't find on other consoles. So Microsoft introduced some real competition to the PS2 and Sony made a few moves in direct response to the Xbox. So they slashed the price to $199, making it $100 cheaper than the Xbox. And to compete with the Xbox's new internet connected functionality, they introduced a PlayStation Network adapter in 2002. So despite the competition, the PS2 received praise and accolades year after year. Some would say Sony got a bit full of themselves when it came time for the next iteration of PlayStation. And unfortunately for them, the PS3 would be a hard and fast fall from grace that would send Sony crashing right back down to reality. So I do just wanna take a quick break from the backstabbing and the drama that went into PlayStation to thank this video's sponsor, Policy Genius. So if you've never heard of Policy Genius, that's okay. Uh, they're actually the largest online broker of life insurance policies. And since 2014, they've placed over 100,000 policies with people, which means they've got over and responsible for around $45 billion in life insurance coverage. So this is like a tough thing to talk about. I don't think anybody in the world likes to think about themselves like not being here. But like eventually things like that are going to happen and you want to protect your family. And one of the best ways you can do that is simply with a life insurance policy. And the folks at Policy Genius have made getting a life insurance policy simple, and most importantly, not scary. 
So signing up and, and starting to get quotes is really simple. So go to policygenius.com slash John Rettinger and just hit get started. So you go through and fill out some information about who you are, your age, your weight, uh, some very general health questions. And then once you do that, it's going to give you some options for policy length. If you want 10 years, 15, 20, 25, 30, whole life, whatever you want. So if you wanna try this for yourself or you're thinking about maybe wanting to protect your family, uh, again, the link is policygenius.com slash John Rettinger, and you can decide if a life insurance policy suits you. Ladies and gentlemen, director and producer, Michael Bay. There have been some pretty memorable keynote moments over the years. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Michael Bay for joining us. But Sony's 2006 E3 press conference remains a great example of what not to do. This is the final PlayStation 3 controller. It was a presentation criticized for its slow pacing, PowerPoint-like introduction, and just straight up awkward moments, and a price reveal deemed outrageously out of touch with reality. To say the PS3 was off to a bit of a bumpy start would be an understatement. So see, by now, the glory days of the PS2 were coming to a close, and two companies remained at the forefront of the console wars, Microsoft and Sony. Nintendo was hard at work internally on the Wii, but for serious gamers, it was a side piece to the two main consoles. So the Xbox was not the breakout hit that Microsoft had hoped for, but they came back swinging with the Xbox 360 a few years later. And this new Microsoft console had its own troubles. I'm looking at you, Red Ring. But it's also much better positioned to compete directly with the PS3. It had a much less aggressive look, a standard PC-like development architecture, and a pretty reasonable 299 starting price tag. Microsoft also had a bit of a lead as the 360 was on store shelves about a year before the PS3 would officially launch. Sony's E3 presentation would be crucial to the console's success as sort of a preview, given the year prior had, let's just say, drawn some criticism. The company discussed moving the PS3 to a cell-based processor architecture and showed off a boomerang-style controller that was incredibly polarizing. They also made a bunch of promises about the system, claiming it would have two HDMI ports, three Ethernet ports, and six USB ports. It was time to do some damage control and set the record straight. It's Ridge Racer. Ridge Racer. Unfortunately, things just didn't go as planned. The keynote received an incredible amount of backlash from the community and industry analysts complaining about many things, but amongst them, the biggest issue was price. Remember, the PS2 launched at $299, later getting cut to $199. Sony fans expected something in that ballpark, which made the price reveal even more awkward. The PS3 would start with a 20 gigabyte hard drive at a $499 price point, and was not a good look, especially when Microsoft was selling the brand new 360 at $299 and $399 configurations. One of the most infamous quotes that made the rounds after the keynote was from a Microsoft exec, straight up making fun of Sony, and saying customers could buy both an Xbox 360 and a Wii for the same price as a PS3. Multiple Microsoft execs later recounted that Sony's loss would be their gain. I will tell you the single moment when I knew we had real upside was when they announced the pricing at E3. I mean, literally- was that, that was a shock to you? Oh, you had no, total shock. No idea? Total shock. We knew their bill of materials was gonna be too expensive, but we thought they'd suck it up. Yeah. He, Kaz said the price. And the, uh, the room we were in went silent. And, and I said, did he really say what I think he said? You know, I said, absolutely in my mind, and many of us said out loud, oh, this, this could be really fun. Sony tried to justify the price by touting the PS3 cell processor's supercomputer level performance. But that ended up backfiring after multiple developers complained on the record the PS3 was difficult to develop for and, quote, a waste of everyone's time. The PlayStation 3 makes my life as a software developer much harder. You make tiny little changes to code running on one of the SPEs and the entire thing will grind to a halt. So the cell processor, despite being crazy powerful, required much more time, effort, and resources to develop a game, let alone take advantage of the system's full potential. In addition to that, consumers couldn't see the difference, or more importantly, justify the price premium when the games on the super powerful cell processor looked indistinguishable to games on the Xbox 360. The cell processor and built-in Blu-ray drives also made the PS3 difficult and expensive to produce at scale. 
Numerous launches were delayed due to supply constraints, and a former Sony exec said even at that high price tag, Sony was still losing money on each PS3 they sold. It was difficult to manufacture. It was extremely expensive to manufacture. So at the price it came out at, everybody knew that wasn't a consumer-friendly price. And amazingly, that was losing a lot of money for Sony even at that price. So wow. um, it was it's being made the captain of the Titanic just before it hit the iceberg. <laughs> I mean, it was not the ideal time. But despite all of its early missteps, the PS3 did get a lot right and eventually evolved into an excellent console and a really worthy competitor to the 360. It would take Sony a long time to catch the Xbox 360, but eventually they did, thanks in large part to a cheaper PS3 Slim model that would launch a few years later, as well as the battle over HD DVD and Blu-ray being won by Blu-ray, making the PS3 one of the cheapest Blu-ray players on the market at the time. Sony would have a few more ups and downs over the next couple of years. Despite the PS3's lower price and rising popularity, the company had a major PR meltdown when the PlayStation Network was hacked back in 2011. And although PSN was down for less than a month, the damage was catastrophic, with users' personal info and allegedly some credit card info stolen during the initial breach in the weeks leading up to the outage. So with all of this, the stage was set for a really divisive 2013. As Nintendo's Wii line began to fade, Microsoft and Sony prepared for the fight of a lifetime. Both now seasoned veterans at this point, they had a lot to prove with their next launch. Microsoft needed to show they could produce consistent, reliable hardware from day one. And Sony had to get gamers back on their side and launch with a console much more friendly to consumers and developers. After going back and forth to claim the number one title, all eyes were on just one week in 2013. New at 11, dozens of people have been waiting for hours for a chance to get the new gaming console. Best Buy and Enfield is participating in this midnight release of the PlayStation 4 tonight, and it has people waiting in anticipation. Very cold, it seems. When the clock struck midnight on November 15th, thousands of Sony fans across the world braved the frigid cold of an early November morning to get their hands on Sony's latest and greatest console, right at launch. The PS4 would launch just seven days before Microsoft's Xbox One, and Sony fans made their enthusiasm and console allegiance loud and clear. The PS4 was the console that had it all. And just about a year prior, Sony wasted no time addressing all of the PS3's shortcomings and paving the way forward for the PS4. A big part of this would be abandoning the cell processor used in the PS3 and touted by Ken Kunaragi as the future for multiple Sony devices. There was also a new slightly improved DualShock controller that touted an LED light bar, touchpad, and speakers. While that was great, the announcement that earned the most praise from Sony fans was not a new feature, but more a lack of one. Before Sony's E3 press conference, Microsoft had a blunder of their own. Announcing the Xbox One would need to be always connected to the internet and that sharing physical games might become a thing of the past. Sony moved crazy fast and used this to their advantage, driving the point home to cheering fans in the room that the PS4 would not have any such limitation. For instance, PlayStation 4 won't impose any new restrictions on the use of PS4 games. The Xbox One was also priced this time around, starting at $499 due to the included Kinect camera, which was at the time an integral part of the new system. All of this was great news for Sony, as the restriction-free, high-performance $399 PS4 looked better and better to consumers, deciding between both next-gen consoles. Surprisingly, despite any pre-launch issues, both Microsoft and Sony debuted their consoles in November of 2013 to a pretty level playing field, and both devices sold incredibly well. The PS4 received over 1 million pre-orders, while the Xbox One is right behind with 1 million units sold in the first 24 hours. And now, really more than ever before, consumers were choosing a console for not only what it was now, but what it would be in the next four or five years. Both the Xbox One and PS4 were pure powerhouses, capable of producing jaw-dropping gameplay, but software preferences and console exclusives would become a big decision maker for many avid gamers. And as time went on, it was clear that the PS4 was a runaway success for Sony and all the effort put into retooling the console and reworking the missteps from the PS3 not only put them back on track, put them back at the front, this time squarely ahead of Microsoft. 
So midway through the original console's lifespan, both companies set out to release updated models that were slightly more powerful and capable, taking advantage of the latest visual tech that had quickly become commonplace, things like 4K and HDR. Sony released a PS4 Pro in 2016, touting better graphics performance, a now one terabyte hard drive, and improved support for the PSVR. Microsoft followed suit a year later with the Xbox One X, also packed with a more powerful processor made for 4K gaming experience. But now comes the best part of the story, and that's everything that hasn't happened yet. We're now on the cusp of the next console revolution, and as Sony and Microsoft blur the line between concept and reality, we're expecting a bigger leap between generations than we've ever seen before. So let's start with Microsoft, who has been an unshakable thorn in Sony's side basically since the beginning, is entering into the next era with a major chip on its shoulder. They've been working on the Xbox Series X, a more powerful and refined Xbox that goes all in on function and much less on form. Sony, on the other hand, is taking the opposite approach, giving the PS5 a complete design overhaul from the PS4. The console has a totally new futuristic look that is a big departure from any previous PlayStation. There's also a new controller that isn't quite as crazy as that boomerang concept we saw back with the PS3, but does look to give us the classic DualShock design with a new modern look. Sony also plans to produce two flagship consoles, a standard PS5 and a digital-only version. While Microsoft will follow suit with the flagship Series X, and a less powerful, less expensive Series S. So both models of the PS5 are available in the same retail range, with the digital-only edition selling for 400 bucks, while the disk drive-equipped PS5 is priced $100 more at 500 bucks. So right in line with the Series X. And now, that's it. We have to do a little bit more waiting. Decades of hard work, milestone success, some colossal missteps, have all led Sony to where they are right now, at this moment. And I don't think anyone at Sony 30 years ago ever imagined the company would be transformed from this small consumer tech company to arguably the biggest, most powerful, disruptive company to break through and dominate the video game industry. It's a story that's full of twists and turns, or risks and rewards, lots of successes and plenty of failures. But as Sony armors up and soldiers on to fight the next era of the console wars, if history has taught us anything, it's that Sony is an underdog that will never stop fighting to win.